In this video we're going to be working on the topic how do glasses work. This video is going to look at the wave nature of light and at reflections. In this video we're going to be looking at the nature of light and then at reflections. So we're going to start by considering what light actually is. In the street lights topic we saw that the photoelectric effect provided evidence that light was actually made up of little particles. So this is the quantum mechanical view. Light is made up of particles. The other view is that light is a wave travelling through space. Now both views are actually correct, but for this topic we're going to be considering light as a wave. But first of all, let's just have a quick look at Joe explaining some other evidence that light is actually a particle. Newton believed that light was particles. Let's see why. In light, my hand casts a shadow. That's also what we'd expect of particles. So light shares that property with particles. Do waves cast a shadow? Well, it depends on the wavelength. At 10 kilohertz, the wavelength of sound is about 34 millimetres. The book is six times wider than the wavelength. The signal is weaker where we would expect a sound shadow. There are also interesting variations near the edges. We'll return to these when we discuss diffraction. At 340 hertz, the wavelength is one meter and it diffracts around the object. No strong shadow at all. Conclusion. We only see shadows when the wavelength is rather smaller than the object. Once the wavelength is longer than the object, it just diffracts around it. So diffraction depends on wavelength. So light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. As we saw in the speed camera topic, the electromagnetic spectrum consists of things such as radio waves, gamma waves and visible light. Visible light tends to have wavelengths between about 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers and it actually consists of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. Let's have a look at Joe explaining now how light fits into the electromagnetic spectrum. The spectrum of visible light covers wavelengths from about 400 to 700 nanometers, all those wavelengths less than a millionth of a meter. The speed of light is large, so the frequencies of visible light are too high to measure directly. We now know that light is electromagnetic radiation with this range of wavelengths. Visible light covers only about one octave in the huge electromagnetic spectrum. Beyond violet, waves with shorter wavelengths are called ultraviolet. We can't see ultraviolet, but it can cause our skin to tan or to burn. Beyond ultraviolet lie X-rays and gamma rays, which are increasingly more dangerous than ultraviolet. Wavelengths longer than those of red light are infrared. We can feel these as warmth on our skin. And our warm skin emits infrared too. Very hot objects emit radiation in the visible as well as in the infrared. At successively longer wavelengths, we find microwaves and a huge spectrum of radio waves. One very special thing about light is that it always travels through a vacuum at a constant speed. This speed is known as the speed of light and it's equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So it's a very fast speed. It was realized by Einstein in his special theory of relativity that the speed of light was the same in every reference frame. So this is actually one of the postulates that special relativity is based upon. It's only based upon two postulates and that's one of them. Maxwell also realized in his equations of electromagnetism that the speed of light is constant. So if we have the right equipment, we can actually measure the speed of light in the laboratory. So let's have a look at Joe doing this measurement now. When James Clerk Maxwell discovered that the speed of electromagnetic waves was similar to that measured for light, he proposed that light was an electromagnetic wave. So, let's measure the speeds. In this experiment, 
light from a laser enters from the left and is reflected towards us by the first mirror. It then passes through a piece of glass acting as a beam splitter. Some of the light comes straight towards us and strikes this detector. The rest of the light is reflected across to this mirror, back again, and then via another mirror to the second detector. The laser light looks continuous, but actually this laser emits millions of extremely short pulses every second. By the way, very short laser pulses are also used in fibre optics to transmit signals very rapidly. Here, the light pulses are received by the detectors and shown on the oscilloscope. The light travelling via the second path arrives later, of course. When I move the mirror by 10 centimetres, the second round-trip path is decreased by 20 centimetres. This reduces the delay by 0.65 nanoseconds. Dividing distance by time gives the speed of light in air 30 centimetres per nanosecond. Now, you may have noticed that we've said the speed of light in a vacuum is constant. The speed of light does actually depend a bit on the medium through which the light is travelling. So we're going to look at this later in the topic. We'll be seeing how when light moves into a more, what's called optically dense medium, it actually slows down a little. So when light enters glasses, it comes to a boundary between the air and the glasses. So let's have a think about what can happen at boundaries. In the speed camera topic, we saw that when waves come to a boundary, two things can happen. We can have reflections and we can have transmission as well. So in the remainder of this video, we're going to be considering what happens to the light that is reflected. So in order to do this, we're going to be representing light as rays. So rays are small arrows like this, which show the direction the light is travelling in. So the actual wave fronts making up the light are perpendicular to the ray. So let's start by considering the law of reflection. This describes what happens when light hits a surface. Let's start by drawing a normal to the surface. A normal to the surface is a perpendicular line to the surface. And we say that the angle of incidence, which is the angle between the incoming ray and the normal, is equal to the angle of reflection, which is the reflected ray, the angle between the reflected ray and the normal. So if we represent theta i as the angle that the incoming ray makes with the normal and theta r as the angle that the reflected ray makes with the normal, then we've got theta i is equal to theta r. And this is known as the law of reflection. So I'm sure you've all looked in a mirror. Just imagine now yourself looking in a plain flat mirror. What you see when you look at that mirror is an image of yourself and it appears to you as if your image is the same distance behind the mirror as you are standing in front of the mirror. So what we're going to look at now is a technique called ray tracing that we'll be looking at in a bit more detail in this video. And we can use ray tracing to describe why it is that when you look in a mirror, it looks like you are actually standing behind the mirror. So let's do some ray tracing now. What we're going to consider is here is the floor. Here's a mirror. And we're going to represent U by an arrow. So we'll have your eyes here at the top of your head. Head goes a bit above the eyes, but this makes it nice and simple. Okay, and we're going to consider what you see when you look in the mirror. And to do that, we're going to do what's called ray tracing, which is tracing out the paths of some of the light rays. So first of all, let's consider the light rays originating from your eyes. Let's colour these ones red. So here's the light ray. It goes straight to the mirror from your eyes and then is reflected back along the same path. Now, your brain doesn't actually realise that there's a mirror there. And so we can dash this line backwards. Your brain thinks that this 
light ray which is being reflected off the mirror is actually coming from somewhere here behind the mirror. Now let's consider what happens to the light ray which reaches your eye from your feet. So let's code this light ray as a blue light ray. Now in order to get up to your eye here, it's going to have to go to the mirror and be reflected back up to your eye. And we know from the law of reflection that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So it's going to have to be reflected off the middle of the mirror here, halfway between your feet and your eyes. And then it is reflected back to your eyes up here. But once again, your brain does not realize that the light ray has been reflected. So it sees the light ray as traveling in a straight line towards it, and so it interprets it as coming from somewhere behind the mirror here. And let's do one more light ray. Let's consider a green point on your body here, say. Now, in order for light to reach your eyes from this point here, it's going to have to be reflected off the mirror halfway between this point and your eye. So let's draw that now. So it's going here and here. And again, your poor brain doesn't realize that this ray is not always traveling in a straight direction. And so it imagines it as coming from somewhere back here. And so what your brain sees is actually an image coming from behind the mirror. Here's your head, here's that green point, and here's your feet, all lined up behind the mirror. So this is the image that you see. Now in this case, we refer to this image as a virtual image because the image isn't really here. The light rays are not actually originating from here. It's just that your brain interprets the light rays as coming from here because your brain doesn't realize that the light has been reflected. So let's have a look now at Joe discussing image formation. A reflection in a mirror is an example of an image and in this example, I am the object. To draw a ray diagram, we show just two rays coming from any point on the object and extrapolate to their apparent origin. The image is behind the mirror, but the light that you see doesn't come from the position of the image. For this reason, we call this a virtual image. Note that image and object have the same height. Here we say the magnification is plus one, the plus because the image is right way up. By the way, here is a misleading puzzle for you. Why does a mirror seem to invert a person's image from left to right? not from top to bottom. In contrast, this image in a concave mirror is inverted. It has negative magnification. Further, it is a real image. Rays of light really do arrive on the screen to make the image. We look at two important types of concave mirrors. A parabola has the geometrical property that all rays parallel to the axis are reflected through a point called the focus. Reflecting telescopes use parabolic mirrors. A section of a sphere approximates a parabola, provided that the mirror radius is rather less than the sphere radius. A spherical mirror has the advantage over a parabola that any radius is an axis of symmetry. Here, we concentrate most of the light falling on this mirror, a few hundred watts, onto a small image of the sun, which of course raises the temperature of the screen. This experiment tells us the focal length of the mirror. The asymmetric shape of the sun's image tells us that this cheap mirror is not perfectly symmetric. So did you notice how light reflected off a curved surface came to focus at a single point? We're going to look at why this is. We're going to start by considering a concave mirror. A concave mirror looks like this. One way to remember the shape of a concave mirror is that a concave mirror can form a cave. So if, if your mirror surface forms a cave, it's concave. If it's bent the other way, it's what's known as a convex mirror. So we'll be looking at convex mirrors in a few minutes. So to show why everything comes to focus at a point, let's now trace out what happens 
through a series of parallel light rays which enter, which are reflected off, a concave mirror. This is a concave spherical mirror. which means that this forms part of the surface of a sphere. Let's go through and start by defining some important terms in ray optics. The line through the middle of the mirror, which is at a normal to the surface, this line here, is called the principal axis. Now the radius of curvature of the mirror is equal to the radius of the circle from which this mirror was cut, or sphere as the case may be. So we call the radius of curvature C, and the distance from C to any point on the mirror is equal to some value, capital R say, which is the radius of the sphere of which this mirror is cut. So C is equal to the center of curvature. And then a very important point is the focal point. So the focal point is where all the light rays align. So let's have a look at where that is now by sketching on some light rays. Let's use green light rays. So when we're considering, when we're trying to find the focal point, the best way to do it is to draw on a series of parallel rays. So here's our first ray, it comes in here. Now because this is along the principal axis, the principal axis forms a normal with the mirror at this point and so the angle of incidence is zero and the angle of reflection must also be zero and so it is reflected back along the same line. Let's consider another ray coming in parallel. Here's our parallel ray. Now let's draw a normal to the surface. So here's our normal to the surface and we know that the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. So we have an angle in here and we have the same angle over here. So let's draw our ray leaving this surface now. So it will look something like that and it is going in this direction. And another parallel ray, this time below the principal axis. Here it is. And we've got the angle of incidence equal to the angle of reflection again. So let's draw it reflected back. It's reflected like this. And another parallel ray, even further from the principal axis. Here's our normal. And again, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So we can draw a reflected ray down here. And finally, another one here. And it is reflected up through here. So you can see all the reflected rays go through the same point. This is assuming this is a perfect mirror. In reality, this is often more of a line than a point. But this special point here is called the focal point or the focus. So we can label it with an F. And this is the focus. So when we have parallel light rays coming in, they all pass through the focus of the concave mirror. Now one final thing that we should define is the focal length. The focal length is the distance between the focus and the mirror. So this here is, this length here is the focal length. Now let's consider what you actually see when you look in a concave mirror such as this one. Now I strongly recommend that you try this at home. You can try it at home using a spoon and a pencil. So the spoon has got a concave surface here where you scoop your food and a convex surface on the other side. So you can repeat this experiment by having a pen very close to the concave surface and slowly moving it away and looking in the spoon to see what you see. So let's have a look at what we see now. I'm going to use a whiteboard marker 
and we'll be looking at the image of the whiteboard marker formed in the concave mirror. So first of all, I'm holding the whiteboard marker very close to the concave mirror. Hopefully you can see the actual whiteboard marker and there's also an image of the whiteboard marker reflected from the mirror. The image is the right way up and it's also slightly larger than my actual pen. Now I'm going to start slowly moving the pen away. As I move the pen away, the image in the mirror is getting larger and larger. And that happens up to a special point here, where now all you can see is the grey and then just a little bit in front. Can you see now the image is upside down? It's a large upside down image. Now as we get close, further and further away from the mirror, the image remains upside down and it's getting smaller and smaller. So let's look at ray tracing now to explain why we see this with the image of the whiteboard marker in the concave mirror. Now let's imagine that we're looking at a concave mirror. Here's your eye. So if the focal point's here and we've got some radius of curvature which is around here and let's imagine that we're looking at this object. We're going to start with the object very close to the mirror like we did in the demonstration. So let's represent the object as an arrow here. Now what we're going to do is a technique of ray tracing in order to work out where the image for this object is. So when we're doing ray tracing, we always trace two rays. One of the rays we draw parallel to the principal axis. So this is the principal axis here and we can draw a ray coming from the top of the object parallel to the principal axis and then when it is reflected off the mirror, the reflected ray goes through the focal point. We know that because that is how we found the focal point in the first place. Now what we do is draw a second ray. In this case, we draw a ray coming from the focal point and going to the object. So here's the ray, it goes to the top of the object and is then reflected off the mirror. When it's reflected and it's come from the focal point, it's reflected parallel to the principal axis. So this is our reflection like this. Now these rays are not converging at all and no image is formed here. The image is actually formed below behind the mirror because what our eye sees is these rays coming towards it and it doesn't realize that they have been reflected off the mirror. So in fact they go back behind the mirror like this. And what we see is this point where the two rays cross, which is the same as this point here, that is where we see the image. So we actually see the image being formed here. So this is a virtual image. And this is the right way up. If we did the same thing, ray tracing, for the bottom of our whiteboard marker or our arrow here, both the rays would be reflected directly along the principal axis. So this point corresponds to this point here. We just see rays traveling towards our eye like this and we think that they've traveled from behind the mirror. And that is how we do ray tracing for objects close to the mirror. Let's now look at what happens as we move the objects further and further away from the mirror. Let's now place our object a little bit in front of the focal point. So here's our object here between the focal point and the radius of curvature. Now once again we trace our rays. So the first ray we draw parallel to the principal axis. When it is reflected off the mirror it passes through the focal point. The second ray we draw from the image going through the focal point to the mirror and then when it is reflected back it's reflected parallel to the principal axis. 
Now the point where these rays cross is actually where the image is formed because once again if we were to imagine rays going from the bottom of our object they'd all be reflected back along this principal axis and so this is where the bottom of the object appears and where these rays cross is where the top of the object appears. So let's draw our image here. This is our image and this is actually a real image because the light does pass through this point. So if we put a screen here this image would be formed on the screen. So this is the object this is the image and you can see that it is larger and flipped upside down just like we observed in the mirror. So let's now imagine what happens as we move this object further and further away from the screen. Okay so let's place our object, well let's get rid of this writing principal axis so that we can draw our object there. So here's our object and we use the same technique of ray tracing. We draw our first ray parallel to the principal axis and it's then reflected back through the focal point like that. And then we draw a second ray going from the object through the focal point and it's then reflected off the mirror parallel to the principal axis. So the point where these rays cross, this is where the image is formed. So this is our image. This is once again a real image because it really is there. If we put a screen, we really could see it. And you can see that as we've moved further and further away from the mirror, the image is getting smaller and smaller, but it's still upside down. And that is exactly what we saw in the demonstration earlier. So one application where you'll commonly find these concave mirrors is makeup or shaving mirrors. That's because when an object is close to the mirror, it's actually slightly magnified. And so this makes it more easy to see all the details of your face because they appear slightly larger in the mirror. So now let's have a look at convex mirrors. So this is a convex mirror. It's like this surface of the spoon. It bulges outwards in the middle. So if you look at the image formed in this convex mirror, you can see things in the image appear slightly smaller than they do in real life. So if you look at me, you look at my image, my image is slightly smaller. It's also a bit like looking at a plane mirror because when I look at this mirror, it looks to me like I am actually located somewhere behind that mirror. So that tells us that there's this is going to be a virtual image as the light isn't actually coming from behind the mirror. So let's look at some ray tracing now, which describes what the image from this convex mirror looks like. We'll see why objects appear slightly smaller in the convex mirror. Now the first thing we need to do for the convex mirror is work out where the focal point is located. So in order to work out where the focal point is, we draw parallel rays being reflected off the mirror. So we'll draw the first parallel ray going along the principal axis and it is reflected back along the principal axis. And now we'll draw a ray parallel to this one. Now for it to be reflected, we need to look at where the normal to the surface is and then the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So it's reflected back like so. And let's draw a parallel ray below the principal axis. So it is also reflected black such that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And finally, let's draw another parallel ray up here. 
the normal to the surface is like this and so this is reflected up here like this. And a final parallel ray will be reflected down here like this. And now these rays are not converging. Converging means coming together to a point. They're in fact diverging, moving apart. So if we can imagine an eye looking at these rays, once again the eye doesn't realise that these have all been reflected off the mirror and it actually sees these rays as going back behind the mirror. So let's trace them back behind the mirror. This one here just travels back along the principal axis. This one here travels back here. This one here travels back here. This one here travels back like this and we have back like this. All the rays appear to have come from a single point which is called the focal point as it was for the concave mirror but now it is located behind the mirror. So this is F and it's the focal point. This length along here is called the focal length and we've got some radius of curvature which will be back here and is the radius of this circle. So let's now use the focal point and the radius of curvature to do some ray tracing for a convex mirror. Okay, so the same technique of ray tracing. We draw our object here in front of the mirror. Now for the first ray, we draw it parallel to the principal axis and it is reflected off the mirror somewhere up here. If we extend this ray back behind the mirror, it goes through the focal point. So for the second ray, we draw it slightly differently than with the concave mirror. We draw it as coming from the focal point to the top of the object. So we don't actually imagine it coming from here. We imagine it as originating at the object. So here it's coming from the object to the mirror and it's being reflected. And when it's reflected, because it's been through the focal point like that, it is reflected parallel to the principal axis like this. Now you can see these two reflected rays are actually diverging or moving apart. And so once again, we have to imagine what the eye sees. And the eye traces these back behind the mirror, like this in a straight line parallel to this axis, and they cross at this point here. So this is where we see the image formed. It is a virtual image. as the rays don't really pass through this point, it's just what our brain interprets. And it is behind the mirror and the right way up, which is exactly how we saw the image in the demonstration. So one application where you'll come across convex mirrors such as this is in the side mirrors on cars. These mirrors have a warning on them. Often they'll say, warning, objects in this mirror are closer than they appear. And that's because, as we've seen from the ray tracing, the image formed by these mirrors is actually smaller than the object itself. And if they're smaller, our brain interprets this as further away. So this brings us to magnification. Mirrors can cause an object to be magnified. So a magnification is a change in the apparent size of the object. So magnification can be calculated using the formula magnification is equal to the image height over the object height. Now one trick is that if the image is inverted, that is if the image is upside down compared to the object, we actually have to put a negative sign in front of it. So the negative sign in the magnification indicates that the image has been flipped upside down. Now convex mirrors such as this one have a magnification between 0 and 1 showing that they're making images smaller. So with a convex mirror like this, 
This lets us see a, wild, wilder, a wider field of view, which is why they are used on the side as side mirrors for the carts. So concave mirrors have a much wider range of magnifications and it depends where the object is in relation to the focal point and the centre of curvature of the lens as to what the magnification is going to be. So in this video we've looked at the wave lecture of might, we've looked at the law of reflection and how it can be applied to plane mirrors, that's flat mirrors, concave mirrors and also convex mirrors. And we've had a look at the technique known as ray tracing. Now this topic is all about glasses. And while some light is reflected off the glasses, most of the light, the light which gets to our eyes that we're actually interested in, is transmitted through the glasses. So in the next video we're going to be looking at refraction, which describes what happens to light when it moves from one medium to another medium. Special thanks to Sebastian Frick for filming this. You may have caught a glimpse of him in some of the reflections of the mirror. And thanks to Joe Wolf for producing Fizz Clips, which we made a lot of use of in this video.